And we are live from the epicenter once again, episode number six. Today, um, a super, super crazy, wild, special guest. I'm going to pull him up because he's going to be talking uh, in backstage for without, uh, you know, trying to interrupt me. William, what's up? How's it going? It's good Great. to see you. It's been a long good time. To... Yeah, it's been a very long time. Um, but yeah, I mean, we're going to have to get together sometime soon in person, but come on, we resort, working together. We resort, to this. we resort to this. Yes. So, but, but let's get serious for a second, William. You're, you're the man, the myth, the legend. I mean, how long have we known each other? I think since 2002, 2003, you were like in Hong Kong, you were an analyst, uh, a research analyst for Deutsche Bank. You were writing about China internet no one knew that internet was even uh, uh in china um today you're a man of of many hats with one logo or you're a man of many uh one hat with many logos i don't know what it is oh, sosb Mox, china accelerator who are you who are you please share with the audience who who is william balbin and what do you do so my name is William Babine. I'm a general partner in a VC fund called SOSV. Um, and we are actually trying to innovate in an industry that has seen almost no innovation in you know, 60, 70 years since it was started, it's venture capital. Now the challenge with venture capital is like, it, it's some jerk and you go to them for money and then you say, hey, if you give me money, I'll make you money. Uh, I'm going to I'm gonna use that money to grow my business. And then someday I will sell my business and you'll get your money back plus some. And the problem is that that's, you know, the rules have been broken. Uh, so what we're trying to do at SOSP and MOX, Mobile Accelerator and China Accelerator, is bring it back to kind of like the old days uh, where you have entrepreneurs who are trying to solve a problem for their customers. Uh, and with a little help from us, uh, we can help you make that happen. Uh, and then both you and us actually make money together as one. And the problem is that that's not actually happening in the age of WeWork and the age of Uber. And so uh, it's sort of like a, a revolution in that we're trying to reset the rules where you don't have to raise money to spend ads on Google and Facebook, give all your company away just so you can get users. And you don't even know whether you're gonna be making money on those users. And that's why I think uh, Ronan uh, yep. asked me to be on here. Uh, because what we're about is helping entrepreneurs in mobile internet build a real business uh, without spending lots of money on ads uh, that don't deliver users that actually monetize. Pretty interesting. So um, who, who, who are you helping? Like if I'm a developer out there today, right, what do I do? Do I call you? Um, you know, and what's in it for me as a developer or, or, or a startup in this uh, in this mobile ecosystem? Yeah, so it's it's a little messed up, but there are so many people out there that have built amazing apps that their users love. And then there's a viral effect, at least for a little while. And so they get a couple hundred users, or maybe even a million users, especially for Asian apps. They can get a million new users without uh, spending money. And then they get stuck. It's like this glass ceiling that um, no one will invest in them. Why? Because in order to grow past that few hundred users to so the million users level, they have to spend money on advertising. And the problem with that advertising is that you know, either the attribution sucks or there's lots of, you know, fake users and, and they're spending a dollar to make 50 cents and that does not work. So what we're trying to do is create an ecosystem of friends who all work together, cross promote each other based on trust, 
And, mm -hmm. and frankly, there's not a whole lot of trust in this world anymore, which is why we partner with AppsFlyer because you know, end to end attribution brings trust. Uh, right. In order to scale up without having to give your entire company away to get cash to pay for Facebook and Google ads. And I love Facebook and Google, but not really. <laughs> Well, um, th thanks for the uh, the plug, uh, William. I, I didn't expect that, but uh, with William, anything is possible. And I mean, definitely working together with you guys, we've seen some amazing startups come out of the uh, the Mox program and really go on to to flourish in this industry. What's what's your guys' most successful uh, story to date? Well, we had uh, where the First accelerator, we're a VC fund, SOSP, 740 million US dollars under management. We're investing 64, 65 million dollars a year. Every year, our investments raise 500 million dollars from other investors. But we're not here to talk about that. We're talking about how do you scale up a company without having to raise money? Mm -hmm. um, so we took a, a company called Travel Plan, and they raised a couple of mil, and they're doing very well. Uh, in the travel sector by taking traffic and through amazing data analysis and some really cool algorithms and a little tiny bit of machine learning in there uh, and also a chatbot turning that into travel bookings. It was, it, it was extremely amazing. But the problem is that they were spending so much money on advertising because of the booking group uh, you know, my friends over, you know, Glenn's a good buddy. We used to go drinking together, but they just drove up the price of advertising and travel to ridiculous levels. And, mm -hmm. and so what did we help them with? They had zero users and zero GMV in June of last year when we came in. And by November, they had 24 million users. They did 530K in monthly GMV for the month of November. We only invested 150K. And uh, they raised a $7 million Series A off the back of that because they went from zero to 24 million users with customer acquisition costs of zero. Uh, as of uh, uh, now, they have 45 million users uh, and they're doing a couple million in GMB a month. And how do we do this? Well, it's through partnership, uh, it's through full transparency. And it's through changing the model, changing the game. Uh, and we think that if you've got you know, an app or if you've got a service that's got 30-day retention above 15 to 20%, we can help you to get that higher. And then the other thing is that we can get you free users, user acquisition cost of zero. And the key thing for us is revenue share. Mm -hmm. Most people don't understand how to do revenue share because it's like, oh, you're going to give me free users and I'm going to rip you off. Um, but in this age, when Google, Facebook, Amazon, and five Chinese guys are taking over the entire ecosystem, uh, it's time to come back to trust. It's time to come back to cooperation. And so for Mox, our mobile accelerator, we've got 100 million monthly actives just within our own apps, and we're partnered. Um, with everyone from Samsung to Xiaomi uh, and our ecosystem after five years of beating our head against the wall uh, is doing something amazing. So for the early stage uh, like entrepreneurs out there who have something that's amazing and just getting started, we can help scale you up. Uh, and when it take, you know, when you raise money or you're profitable, you don't have to take the, the free users anymore. You don't have to give up the revenue share anymore. You can just become like a normal company. But we're, we're, we help with that breaking through the glass ceiling where you get to a few million users and profitability. And at that point, you have the freedom to do what you want, not what other people tell you to do. That's amazing. You're solving uh, one of the, the biggest pain points is getting quality users at uh, affordable prices, right? Um, and, and actually real users that help, uh, that monetize and, and scale. So, so it's a great program and uh, for anyone who's out there as a developer, you know, William's your man to get you started uh, in Asia. But uh, let, let's- It's in Asia, it's in Asia. 
Uh, I said it today. Not yet. Yep. Uh, we can't help you in Western Europe. We're just in Asia. Yeah, but William, I, I'm I'm hoping that we do have uh, some audience uh, from Europe and from the U.S. right now um, on this uh, LinkedIn Live. So, like the topic that. Uh, we selected for today is what's next for Asia's tech scene. And given you are the authority and you have the passion for mobile, um, and let's zero in this focus on the Asia ecosystem. What are the hot topics you know that that have popped up, especially given this uh, this global pandemic? What's uh, what what have you uh, you seen and and uh, you know can you can you share some uh, some insights to the rest of the world? Okay, so the most important thing, uh, I mean, we're very data-driven. Uh, we help companies go cross-border, so we have to be data-driven because your gut instinct in your home market is going to tell you what you do. But when you go to Indonesia or, you know, you go to India or go to China, don't go to China. Uh, we're in China, and we can help you, but it's difficult. But when you're going to a new market, you have to be extremely data-driven. Uh, one of the key things that we do, and I mean, the reason why we're partnered is because, you know, AppsFire and a lot of data and some of our other partners help bring that data in and allow you to understand what's actually happening uh, country by country by country. And when you know what's happening, you can optimize, right? Mm -hmm. You can iterate. And so we're extremely data-driven uh, program and investor. Uh, so what has changed? Well, it doesn't really matter uh, that things have changed because we're constantly experimenting. And the one lesson to take away is a lot of the experiments that you did before, right? You, you got your product market fit, you have your users that love you, and you ran those experiments, and you got those engagement rates, and then COVID hit, and then depending on what you're doing, you have to throw that out the window because things have changed and you've got to rerun those experiments because the shit that worked for you before might not work for you now. And the most amazing thing is the shit that didn't work before actually might work now. And so we've been working since March. You know, I'm in China, right? So we, we had this shit happen in February. We got a lead on that. And so we changed business models. We changed charging models. We basically experimented, experimented, experimented. This, you don't need us. You just read Lean Startup and then, you know, you know, and then implement it, right? You mm -hmm. don't need us to do this. But it's data-driven. And we chucked everything out the window. We started experimenting again. And... A lot of people say, oh, you pivoted. No, a pivot is when you fuck something up, right? Right. But what we're doing is changing based on data. And that's called uh, being a smart entrepreneur. That's called being a smart operator, uh, right. data-driven change. And so most of our companies are doing something completely different than they were doing before. And, and it's really working. Um, January, the last 80 companies we invested in over the last two and a half years, January revenue to April revenue, uh, our portfolio grew revenue 61%. Now, we had companies go from high to zero, but overall, it's been pretty good experience because not because like people are benefiting from COVID, but because mm -hmm. people were adapting to uh, the changes and being very data driven about it. Right. Absolutely. I mean, uh, there's nothing wrong with pivoting if, if the data tells you that uh, you need to be heading in a different direction yeah. and using data to spot the opportunities, right? I think that um, companies yeah. too often get fixed on, uh, uh, fixated on something that they believe is, is the right thing that they should be doing when the opportunity could uh, could could really be right there, but they're, they're just missing it because they're not uh, getting access to to right data and 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 uh, accurate data and transparency, right? So I, I love that. Yeah, well, you know, the, uh, I, I've told you this before, usually offline, but you know, ideas are like assholes. Everyone has one. The key right. thing uh, is to take that idea and turn it into a data-driven 
uh, uh, movement, you know, take that idea and test it against the market. And the, the challenge with a, a changing market is you constantly have to be doing that. And that's why you need to have measurement. You need to have uh, that tracking because otherwise you don't know whether what you're doing is working or not. You're just like, uh, you know, guessing. Right. So, William, I mean, uh, one of the, the things that I think you and I share in common about uh, Asia and, and uh, is the advantage of speed, right? And I, I know you love to use the, uh, the example of uh, resilience and the famous uh, cockroach, right? Um, what, like if you have to give, you know, three, four, five tips uh, to this audience about getting into Asia um, or even getting into China, right? What, what would they be? Okay, so the number one tip on coming to China is uh, the easiest throwaway line is don't come. I mean, whatever you're doing in your home market, hopefully it's amazing. Odds are that you bring it to China, it will not work. Okay, so for a lot of mobile apps or for a lot of mobile internet, the easiest way to come to China is if you have users in China and they ask you, I want support, I want more love, you know, come serve me. Okay, fine. And then you go to China. But China is one of the most competitive markets in the world. There is almost more VC money invested in China than the US. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very different, I mean, come on, Google got their asses kicked. You know, Facebook right. got their asses kicked. Uh, well, they didn't even show up. Uh, Microsoft, the only reason why Microsoft has been successful in China is because they got hacked and everybody's got the software for free. And then everybody learned Microsoft programming language and it became the lingua franca of tech here. The Microsoft programming is much more, uh, you know, popular well used in China than anywhere else. And it was not because of anything they did. It's because of what they couldn't stop. You know, innovation is not stopped by borders. So the first thing is, uh, you know, does your app or does your product solve a problem that people in China have? Mm -hmm. The second thing is just be extremely data driven. Okay. So the idea is that you are a startup or you're a big company, right? If you're coming to China, Think about it like another startup. You put a certain amount of capital in place, you put a certain amount of talent in place, and you treat it like you are an angel investor. And this is a friends and family and fool's round. If you guys understand that, basically you put a small amount of money and uh, somebody that you trust into it, it's friends, family, and especially fools. Uh, because that's what it takes to drive any startup. And anything that you do in China is a startup. And then the third thing uh, about China is that don't believe that you can make a lot of money here. Um, almost every single brand or every single large company, even small companies, driving in e-commerce, people lose money for one or two years. That's the standard. So you can expect to lose money for one or two years. Now, here's the problem. You're a startup or you're a small company or a medium company. Can you afford to lose that money for two years uh, in China? So it feeds back into the second point, but whatever you're going to invest in China, uh, you have to have at least a couple of year outlook and you cannot expect China to be anything for you but a cost center. Right. Yeah, I, I love the uh, I love the Microsoft uh, analogy. Although I I I think that uh, there was uh, some sanity to the madness, right? You know, Bill Gates probably masterstroke was release the Kraken, just let let the uh, software go, right? And then uh, yeah, no. like one of my biggest drinking buddies, uh, Joe Chang, was in charge of like enforcement. Everybody in Microsoft was screaming and yelling like they were getting something hot shoved up their uh, exterior uh, about uh, during this time. And it ended up being the best thing that ever happened to Microsoft in China. But they were screaming and yelling all the way to success. That, that, 
that and sometimes William, that's how it happens, right? Um, and so we, geez, time flies, man. Um, we are uh, we're coming up on uh, the twenty minute mark, and uh, typically we don't go over twenty minutes in the in the epicenter. Um, you want to do a quick uh, quick fire round, William? Yeah, just don't tell me what I think about uh, Google, okay? No, no, I won't tell you what uh, you think about Google. Um, yeah. First question: Apple or an uh, Apple or Android? <laughs> Okay, so um, I invest in countries that are low, medium, and in income, and so we're all one hundred percent Android. Amazing, and and do you have a, a musical artist that kind of shaped your formative years as a student, or or or, or as a university? Huh? This is really fucked up. So I was not like the most popular child. And so the first concert that I ever went to, my godmother took me, and it was the Bangles. And uh, um, most people don't know the Bangles because, well, it's a good thing. But uh, they had a song called Walk Like an Egyptian. And, uh, you know, like, yeah, anyway. So uh, the cool thing later, I brought Vice to China. I've been in the music industry now for 15 years. Uh, I used to tell people that I didn't listen to music in the music industry, and then they shut me out, and that was not so cool. But basically, what I just say is like, uh, you know, I love music, even though I don't fucking listen to it. Well, my my the first band that I watched was Air Supply, so it's not that much uh, worse than. Uh, no, no, that, that was one of the three. So my first three albums, and they were tapes: Air Supply, Men at Work and the police. The problem oh, yeah. is that I had no idea until college that Sting was in the police. That's how bad I was. I was William, just, what's I, your favorite I, food? I played way too much for Warhammer 40K and Dungeons and Dragons as a child. What's your favorite food, William? Oh, Jesus. Um, you know. Besides Pai No, no. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, I don't have one, uh, but uh, I really enjoy uh, amazing sushi with an amazing sushi chef and a couple of friends. And then the other thing I do for my friends, especially in Shanghai where you can't do it, is I have a, a, a smoker and I, and I smoke pork ribs and I feed them to my friends because it's not what I want to eat. I, you know, I'm a VC. If I was like super selfish, like nothing you would ever get me. So I cook for other people. And one of the cheapest ways uh, to make people happy is with six, seven hour smoked pork ribs. Oof. Sounds nice. Last question Do you have a, a tech leader that is still active today that you admire? Well, um, no, I mean, Jesus Christ, uh, <laughs> the problem with tech leaders is that, um, they're either psychotic, psych they have psychosis, uh, they're megalomaniac. I mean, I don't know. It's very different. So, um, I'll give you an example of a tech leader. Okay. Uh, there's, uh, my friend, uh, and this is not somebody to idolize. In fact, if you are if you are anything like him, uh, you'll, you'll you'll probably end up in a very bad way. Uh, yeah, no, that's right. Keep on drinking. So my friend Ronen uh, is a leader, and he happens to be in tech. Now, here's the funny thing: people like there's not many people, but people like working with Ronen because he has a sense of humor. Um, people also like working with Ronen uh, or, or with him uh, because uh, he has a sense of purpose and he is numerically driven and that it doesn't really matter whether he, you get his jokes or not. It's very clear. Um, you have full action. Uh, of, of whether you're on the right track or not on the right track. 
And then the funny thing is that um, Ronan uh, still lets uh, his uh, partners and friends and clients uh, come on uh, to his show uh, when they're, uh, you know, obviously uh, uh, inebriated. So thank you, Ronan. <laughs> uh, you're an amazing leader. It's great. I mean, one of the most amazing things happened. So I invested in a company uh, in which Ronan was the head of Asia. And um, we brought Apps Flyer uh, to China. We introduced them to the first five clients in, in, in China. And uh, that was an amazing experience because we used Apps Flyer to prove that our ad network was so much better than anyone else's. Now, the problem is that there's so many fucking ad networks, it doesn't matter. Uh, but uh, uh, because of Renan and Sefi and some friends, I had the opportunity to angel invest. Um, like uh, the, the first, well, not the first round, but the, sort of the, the little tiny round, I had the opportunity to invest in Apps Flyer. Uh, and uh, it was amazing. I met with the CEO in a cafe in Israel. Uh, and uh, and then when I brought it to committee, uh, my committee said, no, we're not going to invest in Apps Flyer. And then I quit. So uh, I think that uh, Ronan and Apps Flyer are uh, simply amazing, uh, not because of the fact that they charge you a shitload of money, <laughs> but uh, the, the fact and that how do I you, this get real, yeah, you get real actual data that you can use to drive your business, full attribution, and it's not just an ad. I mean, we're actually, we have 100 million monthly active users in Southeast Asia and South Asia, and um, uh, it's it's become an extremely good tool, and we don't even do paid marketing. Imagine if we had the money to do that paid marketing. So, uh, you know, we're a leader, uh, and uh, thank you very much. Th thank you, William. Uh, we'll, we'll forgive the shitty internet because we got your voice loud and clear. Thank you so much yeah. for doing this. And uh, it's been an awesome okay. third. You can year. edit out the last part where I said you're amazing. It's okay. I, I didn't forget that. You are amazing too. Um, thank you everybody for joining us uh, today. Thanks.